<laughs> Thank you very much. You already saw a glimpse, but here it is. What is your first impression when you see this sculpture? It is part of the collection of the Wendy Museum, which is a museum of Cold War material culture in Los Angeles. And of course, it uh, represents Lenin. It was originally uh, mass produced in the 1960s, bronze colored. But in October 1989, it was spray painted by demonstrators in Leipzig during the demonstrations which led up to the fall of the Berlin Wall one month later. When I first uh, saw this sculpture, my um, initial reaction was that of shock. And a little later, it joined in with joy. And then I asked myself some questions. Why does it intrigue me so much? What does it mean that this uh, sculpture has the ability to shock? When do images shock? And what is, uh, one step, step further, what is the political relevance of this uh, experience of shock? So I will take you on a short detour about the politics of images. Images uh, have always been central stage to human communities. And that is, of course, because they have the uh, ability to shock or to confront you in a split second. Think of cult images, think of statues of political leaders, but also think of our present day national monuments. And here you see a very recent example, uh, Alexander the Great at the central square of the city of Kop Skopje, the capital city of the um, uh, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Uh, monuments um, uh, express authority, express tradition. They refer to common values. They refer to a common worldview. And they also refer to a common past, although this past can be very grandiose and mythical in the way it is represented. And that is why uh, national monuments, monuments in general, tend to be quite boring or sometimes even repulsive. But there are some interesting exceptions to the rule. Sometimes monuments uh, express contested values or they share a feeling of um, a historical pain, as is the case here in the Holocaust Memorial in the heart of the city of Berlin. Or sometimes a practical joker reactivates the meaning of a monument in quite surprising terms. This is Tra Trafalgar Square, London, uh, the Nelson Monument and an intervention by street artist Banksy. Also, um, at certain moments in history, a, a radical change of social values can lead to a situation where monuments all of a sudden become obsolete, as you can see here. Just remember 23 years ago. So these central images, be they national monuments or otherwise, represent authority and tradition. But especially in modern times, image makers, artists, start, uh, started to feel the need to express their own thoughts, their own feelings, their own perspectives on the world. And in order to be able to do so, they had to think against the grain. They had to develop their own strategies in order to convey singular meaning. How did they do that? I uh, would like to show you a couple of uh, possibilities. The most uh, general strategy is that of illusion. Here you see a painting by the British uh, painter William Turner, who read in a newspaper the story about the captain of a slave ship who threw overboard his ill slaves in order to pocket the insurance money. And uh, in order to um, convey his feelings of moral disgust and outrage, he translated this story in terms of uh, romantic British landscape painting, in this case, an apocalyptic ocean. Another strategy is that of uh, combination or juxtaposition of images. Here you see a photo montage by John Hartfield uh, presenting National Socialism as a puppet ideology of big business. The title of this um, um, work is very fittingly uh, the meaning of the Hitler salute, millions stand behind me. And then there is the third, more subtle strategy of uh, appropriation. Uh, artists and image, image makers uh, um, uh, relating 
to pictorial traditions or relating to iconic images that have become part of our collective memory. I show you some examples. This, for instance, is a famous painting by Goya, the 3rd of May, 1808, is the title, uh, presenting uh, soldiers of the army of Napoleon executing Spanish resistance fighters. And look here what Pablo Picasso did almost 150 years later in his um, work, his protest, his pictorial protest against American aggression in Korea. We just um, heard about this uh, from Judge Song. Another example, this is uh, the famous uh, Venus of Urbino by the Venetian uh, Renaissance painter Titian. Prime example of a very um, highly valued art historical uh, tradition of the female nude as allegory, as personification, as ancient goddess. And this is what Edouard Manet in the middle of the 19th century did to Titian's goddess, turning her into a Parisian prostitute, looking at the viewer, looking at you, and inviting you as her next customer. And the final example, this is another iconic painting by a romantic German uh, landscape painter, Caspar David Friedrich. Wanderer above the sea of fog, an icon of artistic and philosophical reflection on nature. And again, 150 years later, this is a work by Anselm Kiefer from the photographic series Occupations uh, in more or less the same composition, but with one uh, minor difference, as you can see, he's bringing the Hitler salute to the sea. So, of course, this is more than just a play on forms or a play on composition. The artist is also asking intriguing and irritating questions about possible continuities in German cultural histories by appropriating this iconic image. On a more funny side, you could argue that maybe the most um, um, effective way of subverting imperial tradition is by just changing nothing at all except the context. This is a prize-winning a uh, poster design by a Yugoslav um, artist collect uh, collective, Neue Slovenische Kunst, for the celebration of Youth Day in 1987 in former Yugoslavia. Prize winning, but I assume that the jury was not very pleased to learn that it's ex actually an almost exact copy of this 1930s National Socialist poster by Richard uh, Klein, with some minor differences, just to look at the flex, uh, uh, to the right, the swastika you can recognize, to the left, a socialist storm. And another minor detail, on the staff uh, of the right image, you see a German eagle. On the staff of the left image, it magically transformed itself into a socialist peace dove. <laughs> now, you might argue this is not very surprising, because we are talking about two totalitarian systems, and as we all seem to know, pictorial traditions in totalitarian systems are reduced to political propaganda. But then I will show you one more example. This is the cover of the September 2012 issue of the National Review, featuring former president's candidate Mitt Romney and his running mate, <laughs> and his running mate Paul Ryan. And as one astute uh, observer all of a sudden recognized, it combines very beautifully <laughs> was this Soviet poster from Stalinist times, early 1950s. <laughs> with a Soviet worker and a Soviet farmer. Yeah. Yeah. So it shows that pictorial borrowings and pictorial um, um, uh, appropriations don't hold before ideological uh, borders, even if they are east-west borders. So far, I've been talking about the power of artistic traditions on the one hand, and different strategies by visual artists, image makers, on the other hand, to convey singular meaning, to express their own perspectives. But what about the role of the image users? As images tend to be uh, interpretable in various ways, the uh, role of the image users can become very prominent and very important. And uh, as a last part of my presentation, I will give you some remarkable example. Uh, I will be talking about American abstract art in the context of the Cold War. 
looking at some uh, American abstract artists after 1945 in a way they spoke in interviews about, about their own works or wrote about it, you always encounter some uh, recurring elements like an emphasis on spirituality, individuality, uh, pureness of artistic form, or sometimes, as is the case with Barnett Newman, um, also um, an, a total rejection of political realities of its time. For instance, in an interview, Barnett Newman stated that those who could read his work properly would recognize in it the end of both state capitalism and totalitarianism. So now I cordially, cordially invite you to read this work properly. <laughs> <laughs> but then, the, um, uh, the role of the image users. In the late 1940s and especially in the 1950s, the State Department and later the United States Information Agency was instrumental in supporting travel exhibitions of American art to Europe, containing, among other things, these abstract American paintings as a sign of American freedom. They were used in the context of cultural diplomacy, cultural propaganda, if you want, as a sign of American freedom, originality, creative power and energy, and diversity. So all of a sudden, and this is very paradoxical, I think, the non-political or politically critical works of the abstract expressionists in, in the United States were a political asset in uh, the Cold War setting. And that is not the end of the paradox. Because um, uh, the, op the political opponents of modern art didn't just dislike modern art, they thought of it in terms of subversion or communist import. Very um, um, prominent uh, example of this is um, uh, Congressman George Dondero from Michigan, who in many speeches for con Congress and also in several interviews stated his view that modern art is communist because it is ugly, so it must be communist. And he, and, he, and he demanded from the American artists that they portray their beautiful, or they glorify even their beautiful country in plain and simple terms that everyone can understand. I assume he didn't uh, realize that he actually echoed the very demands on art by National Socialist and Stalinist art critics at the same time. Then some of his colleagues in Congress uh, even went uh, one step further. Here you see a painting by Jackson Pollock, and this technique of painting is called drip painting. And uh, one of uh, the colleagues of Don Dero maintains that these drip paintings do not represent art at all. What, what, what is it if it is not art? Well, I can tell you. These are coded maps of the United States indicating strategic fortifications <laughs> as, as one might assume in preparation of a Sof Soviet missile attack. Now I leave it to you whether this is sad or funny or maybe both at the same time. <laughs> Let us return to Pink Lane and to my original question. Why is this such an intriguing image? We just heard or we just discussed how image users in the context of the Cold War could reduce singular images in terms of state interests or in terms of enemy ideologies. I think what is uh, going on here is exactly the opposite. The demonstrators as, as image users took up a repressive political and um, visual tradition and restored its singularity by adding a few shiny colors. They more or less expressed their uh, will to take up agency again, again, to form their own lives, to construct their own lives. So, in doing that, they uh, transformed themselves from image users to image makers and showed how you can be creative in this sense. But there is one more aspect to it, which speaks to me as a historian. Pink Lenin reminds me that you should not write history in black and white. You should not, for instance, discuss the Cold War in terms of winners and losers, in terms of right and wrong, Although, of course, that is part of the story, but you should have an open eye for the complexities, for the layers of history, for deeper meanings, for surprises, and um, also for the idea that history is much more colorful than we sometimes tend to, tend to think. Thank you very much. Thank you.